named a lot of names. Why don't you tell us some of the people that you name in the book? Um, well, I just want to say, too, it's not a tell-all. I left a lot of things out for a lot of good reasons. So um, it's a tell a lot. It's a tell some. It's not even a lot. <laughs> okay. it's, just a, it's just a small part. Um, you know, there, there are the names that you all know. There's the Ja Rules and the Vin Diesels, the Shaquilles. Um, uh, I don't know. Whoever. And was... you're saying you had sex with all the men that you just named? Um, yes. So why did you write this book? Well, initially when I started writing the book, it was for my own purpose. I had gone through a lot um, because the book isn't about sex and it's not about hip hop and it's not about rappers. It's about my journey from being an abused child to being raped as a young child to being, a, you know, going through spousal abuse, a young mother, and then getting into that mm -hmm. and then having to, you know, almost dying with a drug overdose. And, and then once I began to heal myself um, close to about four years ago, I really had to figure out what happened to me in order for me to heal. I had to admit it to myself, what I did. But you had to know that naming the names and talking about the sexual exploits is what's going to it was what was going to put the book, you know, at the top of New York's best-selling list. I mean, it's number I, I, five on the best-selling list in New York Times right yeah, now. Yeah, it is. And we're number three at the Washington Post, and we're also in the Wall Street Journal and all major markets. But honestly, that part was a surprise to me. Um, and I didn't know that. All I knew was that I had to tell the stories that were relevant to my life, and everyone is named. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's funny to me how everyone is so concerned about naming the celebrities, but no one is concerned about me naming the man that raped me when I was 13 and how his life is going to be now. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it just shows me that we're in a celebrity um, hypnotized society. But you were hypnotized by the celebrity Exactly, which so is the whole point of the book. why people are so into Exactly, it. which, okay. is, so, which, which mm -hmm. is what's so ironic and so wonderful because that's the point of the book. Mm -hmm. You know, um, just being hypnotized by that and just really wanting a place to belong and needing a family, needing love and thinking sex and love are equated. And Recently, there has been much conversation surrounding the current image and representation of black women in America, along with whether or not black women are viewed as more hypersexual than other races. You see, the truth is, is that before there was ever a sexy red, a Suki Hana, a Ruby Rose, I Spice, a city girl, the roots of hypersexualizing black women predates the institution of slavery in America. When European travelers, many of whom originated from countries in which the temperatures were significantly cold, traveled to Africa, they were taken aback by not only the minimal amounts of clothing that the Africans wore, but also their seemingly suggestive tribal dances and polyamorous relationships. Based on minimal information and assumption, the white travelers believed Africans, especially African women, to be sexually lewd. Europeans became so fascinated by African sexuality, so much so that they would come back to America to report and write about their visits. When describing their experiences with black women in these African countries, they often quoted how good looking the women were and that the women seemingly appeared to always be plotting and scheming to gain new lovers. The reality is that these Europeans viewed black women and black sexuality through a sick and distorted lens. They were the ones who were in actuality hypersexualizing the culture, a culture that they were not at all familiar with. And the genesis of anti-black sexual archetypes emerged from the writings of these and other Europeans. The summary was that black males were violent and potential rapists and black women were three or fours and Jezebels. You see, historically... White women as a category have been portrayed as models of self-respect, self-control, modesty, and sexual purity. But black women, the Jezebels, were promiscuous and predatory. The Jezebel stereotype was used during slavery as a rationalization for sexual relations between white men and black women, especially those involving plantation owners and their slaves. To put it plainly, because enslaved people were considered property, enslaved women could not legally be raped under the law. Therefore, any child born to an enslaved person would also be enslaved, equating to more money in the pockets of plantation owners. Europeans were the first to monetize black trauma. The Jezebel stereotype led to many black women and girls becoming pregnant frequently as a result. And these frequent pregnancies were proof, reiteration, that black women had such a strong and satiable appetite for sex. Present day, the portrayal of black women and girls as sexually promiscuous Jezebels has continued and is prevalent throughout every facet of the media. The result an intentional push to display black women as one-dimensional sexual beings, side A of the coin. 
But the one thing that's never pushed, the one thing that I rarely hear talked about is the fact that the hypersexualization of black women is rooted in trauma. The same trauma that preceded the Jezebel stereotype, the same trauma that black women experienced during slavery as victims of rape, as sexual concubines of plantation owners and their friends, forced herbal abortions in an effort to save their children from a life of slavery, and the dehumanizing act of wet nursing, which required enslaved mothers to give up their liquid gold, aka breast milk, to the biological children of plantation owners while their own infants were fed cow milk. The hypersexualization of black women is rooted in trauma and the sexuality of black women has never been protected nor honored, monetizing trauma. Janae Wary, a.k.a. Sexy Red, was born and raised on the north side of St. Louis, Missouri. And I've talked about St. Louis a few times in some of my Instagram posts in which I described it as a sleeper city. And what I mean by this is that St. Louis is often slept on. It's one of those cities that most people don't really think about. They haven't had any major mainstream rappers or artists in recent years. And since the media is a driving force of our culture, Sexy Red, in a way, has helped put St. Louis back on the map. And in interesting fact about St. Louis is that it is known as Brick City because it sits on a large deposit of high quality red clay used for brick laying and at one point was home to the world's largest brick manufacturing company which is why the majority of their homes are made out of brick. These beautiful brick homes or doll houses as they refer to them due to their similarity have fallen victim to brick thefts since the early 70s entire buildings blocks and parts of whole neighborhoods in the inner city are in despair run down and abandoned and for the last 60 years of st louis history the north side which is sexy red's home has remained the most misunderstood stereotyped and neglected section of the city in fact for multiple years running st louis has been ranked as one of the most dangerous places in the united states a product of poverty in the north side of St. Louis, Sexy Red worked at a young age in order to help her mother pay bills. She felt bad seeing her mother forced to wear the same outfit repeatedly and unable to afford to keep their lights on. Sexy Red quickly became popular at her school and in her neighborhood for doing hair and worked out of her home. Her claim to fame was a result of a diss track she made about her then cheating boyfriend and father of her first child. Once her music began circulating in the streets of St. Louis, people began to book her to play at house parties and encouraged her to pursue a career in music. The first song that put Sexy Red on the map was A Thousand Jugs. And after that, pretty much every song she has dropped has went viral, including the notorious Pound Town. Following Pound Town, Sexy Red has seen exponential growth as an artist and has been fast tracked to become one of the most popular artists of our time. In summer 2023, Billboard sealed the deal by declaring her as one of the biggest breakout artists of the summer, but not without public scrutiny, though. Sexy Red has had these internet streets in shambles, which is what I would like to explore further today. So everyone knows that Sexy Red is not the first female rapper or artist to push a sexual agenda. Practically every female rapper has. After all, that is usually how they become relevant in the industry and stay relevant in the industry. Selling sex. And the sad part about monetizing trauma is that the label execs have fully come to understand that if a woman is not selling sex, she is not worth the backing and financial investment. You see, the problem that everyone has with Sexy Red, whether they want to admit it or not, is because a real city girl done finally hit the stage. Sexy Red is too city for the city girls. You see, it was all fun and games when Carisha, Meg, I Spice, Mulatto were giving 304 music for the vibe and for the culture with just the right amount of polish and cure. But enter Sexy Red with no polish, no cure, no racially ambiguous aesthetic, darker skin, not being the preference to most men, no BBL, tattoos all over her face and her body, gang affiliation, ready to drop STD name lip glosses and being dog walk for entertainment and really being from the trenches. Sexy Red does not fit the mold. She's a colorist's worst nightmare. Can you tell us like the craziest thing that's ever happened to you? Mm. 
crazy. And it's gonna stay between us. I got raped before. That's the craziest thing that ever happened to me. Maybe something a little under that. <laughs> okay, <yeah, but laughs> maybe something. Let's go okay, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Like, like, sorry, maybe something. Shoot like, out. There we go. Shoot yeah, out. There, there we go. High there speed. Go. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yes. more what we were yes. thinking. Yeah. 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 That was crazy. Wait. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. What's. <laughs> we, we, we just want to say we are sorry that that happened. Yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, wait, that's that is bad. That is mm -hmm. unfortunate. It's not something we should speak on. Yeah. Okay. And since everyone is in it to monetize the trauma of black women, the majority of black male artists are not truly in the business of protecting black women, especially darker skinned black women. See, they'll never want to admit that colorism plays a part into the hate that sexy red gets. But it's the truth. We already know that on side A of the coin, the Europeans did it. But on side B, black people do it too. Black men are okay with doing business with Sexy Red since she's currently the hot topic and on trend. They will monetize off of her. They'll use her in their Instagram photos for likes and views, but they're not truly invested in her as a black woman, like many of their counterparts within the industry. Layati would never marry or seriously settle down with a woman like Sexy Red or offer her any type of security or protection. And although he's born to a black woman, he would much rather lay up with and procreate with what is deemed to be the preference in today's society. He'd rather dilute his bloodline with a woman that drags the hair of black women, the same hair his mama has, while channeling her inner bonquisha with stitch braids, makeup, and filters because we're on trend. Black women will always be on trend. I guess it's okay to have a chocolate baby once we intertwine hair textures. Maybe that's what will make it all better. You know, you can't make this up. They'll do interviews with Sexy Red until the cows come home. They'll post her in pictures for clout all while sleeping with the preferences. They'll link up with you and your hood and their hometowns for photo ops. But again, we know who is chosen time and time again to share their wealth with. The world does not want to humanize black women because it will require them to truly face the damage that has been done. Sexy Red sharing that intimate part of her with Lil Yachty and his co-host humanizes her. You see, similar to the world, Lil Yachty wants to hear about the shootouts, the coonery and buffoonery. Her sharing her experiences with being raped humanizes Sexy Red, which in return makes you have more empathy and compassion for her. But if we keep the focus on the shootouts, if we keep the attention on the ignorance, then we can keep her as this mythical figure that is only good for the antics. And again, that's the thing that nobody wants to talk about. This is how you monetize trauma. Let me keep your focus on what's not important, like STD name lip glosses and elite sex tape, while you overlook the underlying trauma like rape at an early age that has contributed to some of these behaviors. See, y'all got mad at me in amygdala when I talked about how real city girls are able to move a certain way because they are fueled by trauma more often than not. Traumatic experiences just like Sexy Red. 304 behavior is not normal behavior, no matter how many ways y'all try to spin it or justify it. 304 behavior is not normal behavior, and it is often the result of trauma. And one of the first things that come to mind when I think about women who carry on with this type of behavior is a lack of self-control. The inability to control oneself and one's emotions. I think about post-traumatic stress disorder, which often manifests as hypersexuality. It's a coping mechanism. But you know, one thing that I respect about Sexy Red is that at least she's authentic with it. Unlike these new age ninjas, they want to tote guns so bad. They want to be the bad boy, alpha male image and aesthetic so that they can get attention from the women they want the street cred, but when it's time to do that time, when it's time to get on that stand, they ready to sing, all in jail getting their commissary took. Same thing with the new age 304s. They want to be one foot in and one foot out. They want to turn it on and off like a light switch. They want the hypersexual look, but they don't really, really want to get in that field. They want to sleep with married men, but want to cop pleas from here to London when they're caught out about it. They say they want a trick, 
but they're really falling in love and going outside and then claim that life is sending them chaos when they were willing participants in the mess and thought it was a flex. They say the 304 lifestyle is cool for y'all, but it's not cool for their daughter. It's not cool for their kid. They say they want to be respected, but they do not respect themselves. They call it cops after getting flown out on a one-way ticket, get hit and split, and then mad because they can't get a flight back home. This is a city girl life, sis. This is what y'all asked for. You see, the city girls, the quote-unquote city girls, are one foot in and one foot out the door. And I hope all my young women listening right now hear me well. It's a trick. Don't fall for the scam. It's the blind leading the blind. Now, to break this colorism issue down even more, I want to do a quick comparison of Sexy Red to one of her female rap counterparts, Miss Mulatto. Excuse me, Big Big Lotto, Miss Big Lotto, a.k.a. I had to change my name because it was on my tail. Now, I was first introduced to Mulatto on a show called The Rap Game, and I remember first seeing her name, and I thought to myself, who in their right mind, what adults in their right mind would sign off on a 16-year-old biracial girl with an African-American father and a white mother to use a name like this. The term mulatto originated in slavery as a way to distinguish slave children who were mixed race. Again, as a result of the Jezebel stereotype, many mulattoes were fathered by white plantation owners or their friends. But catch this, children born to black slave mothers were born into slavery, regardless of who their father was. And children born to white mothers were automatically free, even if they were mixed race. Many plantation owners would go so far as taking their kids away from the plantations so that these mulatto kids could have a free life and would not be enslaved. And the significance of this is racial passing, which is when a person of one racial group is accepted or perceived, a.k.a. passes as a member of another racial group. So oftentimes, mulattoes use their fair skin to pass as white in order to live a life of freedom, in order to not be maimed and hung from trees, and in order to get ahead in life by marrying white and having whiter kids. The more I dilute the blood, the better I will live and be accepted in society. And the reason why it has such a negative connotation is because for decades, lighter skinned black folks were given better opportunities because of their fair skin, which was deemed to be superior. And what I found even more interesting was Mulatto's interviews in that she was bullied as a child for being mixed race. So the last thing that I would expect for someone in this position is to use a name like this for their rap career. Because when we look at it for what it is, you are bragging about being light skinned. You are using your whiteness, your image to get ahead, just like those slave mulattoes had to do back then. And while both of my parents are black and I am unable to speak for the experiences of biracial men and women, what I do know is that statistically, it has been proven that the mother runs the culture of the home. I cannot help but notice how Mulatto's career has evolved and how she has removed herself from the POV of a two-parent household in the suburbs in Clayton County with an image and likeness of her mother as a white woman to now being Big Lotto, grilled out, cornrows, hanging with shooters, dating all the hood stars and making a name for herself in the industry based on her sexual promiscuous lyrics that her father hates because it is not who she is, nor the look that he wanted for her. Mulatto, or Lotto, right? And I, what, I, what, I don't, what I don't think people understand is I put Lotto's record out. The, the deal was if you win on the rap game, you get a single from Jermaine Dupri on So So Death. That single came out. The problem was is that Lotto was 16 years old and the outlets didn't support it. And then nobody was like speaking on it. Nobody talked about it. You know, if you watch the TV show, you saw it. But yeah. if not, nobody was like, so people didn't start talking about Lotto till she started making more vulgar records, dressing more sexual. Being Mulatto's look, her aesthetic. Her lyrics, her swag are rooted in blackness. She understands that to be successful as a female rapper, you need to be two things. Number one, hypersexual and number two, black. 
So she has tapped into, she's, she's fully immersed herself into her black side. And while this is her choice, her prerogative, and the privilege that she has as a biracial woman, the world would never view her in the same way that they view Sexy Red, even though they are on the same campaign. That's what I need for y'all to see. Mulatto has her legs open, butt out, rapping about 304 culture, just like Sexy Red. She is doing the same exact thing that Sexy Red is, but she will never be perceived the same way because she is Mulatto. It will never be the same because Mulatto does not truly have the city girl look or the city girl sauce. Not for real, for real. It's like we accept what comes close to it, but when the real thing comes around, it's too ratchet. Mm -mm. This is what a city girl is now. Again, city girl behavior, Jezebel behavior is rooted in trauma. That's why society loves to say Sexy Red looks like young thug and call her a man. Why? Because she's darker. Sexy Red is a beautiful woman, in my opinion. She's a natural beauty. And I understand that everyone has their own idea of what beauty is or what it looks like. But the truth is, is that Sexy Red is boxed in and deemed more aggressive looking due to her darker skin, due to her blackness. It's not the tattoos, okay? Because we have no problem saying that lighter skin with tattoos is artsy and creative and that these women look good. It's not the runchy lyrics, the runchy mannerisms of the three or four anthems. Because again, we locked in with Mulatto. We locked in with Renny Rucci. We locked in with Ice Spice. The selective outrage y'all have around Sexy Red further perpetuates the issue of colorism within the black community. It further perpetuates that dark skin is more threatening and aggressive and lighter skin is softer, pliable, and easier to deal with. And speaking of Ice Spice, I want to show y'all this picture from the Super Bowl. Taylor Swift invited Ice Spice into her luxury suite for a photo op, if you ask me. But could you imagine her inviting Miss Pound Town up there with her red hair, her Gucci glasses, her Free My Baby Daddy shorts on and her bankroll? Don't worry, I'll wait. Of course not. That's where the PR team draws the line, honey. It's too ratchet, child. She doesn't fit the mold. The very women we call celebrities are just human beings who have chosen career paths that place them in the public eye. Just like us, many of them are struggling with self-identity, self-worth, and battling wounds on the inside that we cannot see from the outside. Sexy Red is blind and is leading a generation of women nowhere fast by pushing 304 music and hypersexualizing herself. And no matter how they try to make her the captain of the 304s, she is not alone. They are all blind. It's the blind leading the blind. Sexy Red is unaware of the damage that it is causing because she's unaware of the damage that it has already done to her. And when your entire life has been centered around just trying to survive, you have to prioritize. And oftentimes, money and survival will take priority over healing those wounds. Her primary focus is getting paid to distance herself from a life of trauma. But you see, money doesn't fix the root of the issue. It just masks it temporarily at that. You see, Sexy Red has touched her first million. She has the money, the status, and the fame to continue to mask. While the current generation, like puppets, are cloning before the money can even hit. And their minds can even decipher the real truth. That's the real issue here. That's the real damage. You see, historically... White women as a category have been portrayed as models of self-respect, self-control, modesty, and sexual purity. But black women, the Jezebels, were promiscuous and predatory. Present day, the portrayal of black women and girls as sexually promiscuous Jezebels has continued and is prevalent throughout every facet of the media. The result, an intentional push to display black women as one-dimensional sexual beings. But the one thing that's never pushed, the one thing that I really hear talked about is the fact that the hypersexualization of black women is rooted in trauma. And the sexuality of black women has never been protected nor honored. And monetizing this trauma comes at a cost. And that cost will always be significant. Until next time.
Yeah. <laughs> Hi.